Okay, hi there. Um, doing. I'm a little early for a wedding, so I'm going to try to knock out the rest of Romans 4 today. Now, keep in mind, I mean, if you know this book, you know I'm just doing a high-level or overview. I've read commentaries on this that are volumes and volumes. You could say so much, you know. I'm trying to move at a fairly decent pace here. Um, I recommend the best commentary I've ever read on Romans is by William Newell. He was a really great classical dispensational evangelical gospel centered cross centered Christ centered uh, person who wrote an excellent commentary verse by verse on Romans you can get it for free if you google it but it's worth buying and having the paperback the print's kind of small it is dense but my goodness uh, that one like locked in a lot of things for me um and it's the best commentary I've read, so just wanted to give you a heads up about that. And then meanwhile, I'm going, to, I'm going through my overview. I wouldn't even call it a commentary. I'd say overview. Uh, so anyway, we talked about how Romans 4 establishes that the inheritance was by faith apart from works. And that the procedure for qualifying you for that inheritance was the propitiation and the redemption and the justification and the reconciliation and the forgiveness, all that related to the death of Christ, God's goal is to bring you in as an heir. It's not just the forgiveness of your sins. God did not create the universe to forgive your sins. We have a low, val low view of salvation, but Romans and Ephesians present a really glorious salvation, which doesn't just cause us to have our sins forgiven, but puts us in Christ, raises us up with him, seats us in the heavenlies positionally now, and and then works everything out to conform us to his image and glorify us so that we're manifested as the heirs of God in the age to come. In the ages to come, he's going to be showing forth the exceeding riches of his grace towards us in kindness in Christ Jesus and this is all out of his love for us, and it is a, all of it is covered under grace. Uh, all of it is covered under salvation. Salvation includes all of that. Every bit of his process that he's working out to bring us into our enjoyment of God himself and cause us to be the expression of God himself. All of that is salvation. From when Jesus presented the blood after he died, you know, his incarnation, his human living, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the outpouring of the Spirit, and then now his work in us. And the Reformed tradition and many Christians are blind to his work in us. They stop at forgiveness of sins and think that's it. And then they just go back to the law as, uh, and repenting. And that's pretty much how they live their Christian life. They just bounce back and forth between law and repentance, law and repentance. And then under, eventually that undermines their forgiveness of sins. And really, they don't fully grasp the forgiveness of their sins. And they're blind. Because they're in the flesh, they end up blind to anything related to the life of God. Anything related to the salvation we have and the good things we have in the Spirit. Which, you know, Paul said that these things are mysteries which the natural man cannot perceive. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, but we know them because we have the mind of Christ and we have received the Spirit that's not of the world, but is of God, that searches out the depths of God to reveal to us mysteries that were predestined for our glory. Uh, hidden wisdom, uh, which is just Christ. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. And he's being revealed to us uh, he's unfolding himself to us. Forgiveness of sins was to bring us into the knowledge of God. And that is going to go on for eternity. But we are just now getting glimpse after glimpse after glimpse as he unfolds himself to us, revealing himself to us. And so we are qualified to see things related to life and godliness uh, and godliness is not a matter of rule keeping, but godliness is a person. Great is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh. 
he was seen by angels he's he, and vindicated and he was raised from the dead that whole thing in first timothy shows us that godliness is a person and the christian life is a person it's christ and his desire is that christ would be manifested in me nothing short of that that's his goal law keeping won't get me there it couldn't justify me in the beginning and it won't sanctify me as i continue it won't do anything for me except work wrath and we'll get to that um okay so comes so this blessed is this man who does the lord does not impute sin so god doesn't impute sin to our account so that we can have the blessing we are blessed and the blessing is singular Galatians 3 says that uh, we are heirs of Abraham, right? That we might receive the uh, blessing of the gospel, which is the promise of the Spirit. The Spirit is the ultimate blessing of the gospel. And the Spirit is the triune God. The Father in the Son who went through death and, in, and resurrection after becoming a man. And now, as the Spirit flows out as rivers of living water, and we've drank of that river when we were regenerated and now that river is connected to me and washes me from within and starts the process of renewing and transforming me and conforming to the image of Christ and that river is eventually going to sweep me up and glorify me and that river is the spirit which is God himself um, so that's the blessing really that's our inheritance uh, comes this blessedness upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When it was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Um, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. Okay, that's a mouthful. But the one ordinance that he was given really was circumcision as the sign of the covenant. And that is considered in Judaism a work. Circumcision is a work. It's entrance into the what they think, and they're wrong, they think it qualifies them for the inheritance because it marks them as God's people. But it doesn't qualify them for the inheritance. Neither did it qualify Abraham for the inheritance. He was justified before he was circumcised, before God did anything. He was justified by believing apart from any works. And Paul makes a big deal in this chapter and in Galatians about the timing of the justification of Abraham, right? He makes sure that we know that it happened before anything happened. Anything, any he, anything he had done, any work you could ascribe. Why is that? Well, because the first New Testament epistle we have was James. And he tried to say that Abraham was justified when he offered up Isaac 30 years later. And tried to say that justification is a matter of faith and works, and faith perfected through works. No, Paul, later writing this, establishes and pins down when Abraham was justified. And it's very important that you understand that because if you put it later in his life, then you can attach works to it. But by putting it at the beginning, he becomes the father of the circumcision. True, but also those who are not circumcised and the key for both of them is that they walk in faith. They walk by faith. They're justified by faith. Faith is what qualifies you for the inheritance. And then circumcision in that day was a sign. Now, see, they were not regenerated. They didn't have the spirit. So we have the true circumcision made without hands. Paul said in uh, Philippians that we were made, uh, we, we are the true circumcision who... Uh, boast in Christ Jesus and serve in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. And then he talks about confidence in the flesh being confidence in religious attainments, confidence in your progress in getting to supposedly know God. We have no confidence in that. So, and I did a message of this in Colossians. 
circumcision is a sign that shows the real circumcision is the putting off of your natural strength putting off of your religious efforts putting off of your ability putting off it's a recognition of the putting off the natural man it is a recognition that i have to be crucified that where they were they circumcised abraham was circumcised on his thingy you know <laughs> and why was that because that was going to be the source of the seed and god was showing him no i have to cut that source because this is going to be supernaturally the seed that is your hope and the promise of salvation is all tied up in that seed has to come supernaturally by promise by the spirit not by works not by strength but by my spirit, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Salvation is of God. And the seed had to be supernaturally born. And he was. Uh, Abraham and I, Sarah were way past time. And then God waited and waited and waited until they gave up all hope in themselves, which is the real circumcision. And then he said, he visited them in the time of life, and Sarah laughed, and she had Isaac, you know. And Isaac is the forerunner to Christ. He's a type of Christ. And so that shows that Christ being manifested has to be a matter of being circumcised, true, but not the circumcision made with hands in the flesh. That was just a picture back then that prefigures the real circumcision. Abraham eventually did have a circumcision in his heart where he just gave up on all his natural efforts. He tried everything, Ishmael, he tried Eliezer, he's like, well, who's going to live before you, God? I've got no seed. Then finally God comes through. And when he finally did give up Isaac at the uh, Moriah, theoretically, he believed in resurrection. He believed God was going to have to raise him from the dead because he knew now that it all had to be of God, not his works. That's the whole point. It's the exact opposite of what you think. Circumcision is not a, a badge of honor or a sign of strength. It is a sign of weakness and dependence on God, and it's embarrassing. It's not over, you know, it's something that's done covered. So, uh, now it's over a dishonorable member, right? <laughs> but now we have the true circumcision. And that's what circumcision is. It's a picture of walking by faith and trusting in God and not in the arm of the flesh. And that's how Abraham learned to walk. And he was justified when he believed God was going to do the impossible. Um, the file, let's see. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through law, but through righteousness of faith. So Abraham, his salvation and what he was justified, again, is for an inheritance that he's going to be the heir to the world. We are. God is going to subject the world to come to the redeemed sons of men. Even angels, even the heavens will be subject to the regenerated, transformed, conformed, glorified, built up, elect of God who are shining with God. That's our future. And that is due to justification. And so righteousness comes through faith. And they, if they are of the law, be heirs, faith is made void and the promise is made of no effect because the law works wrath. For there's no law, there is, where there is no law, there's no transgression. Uh, that's interesting. Now, the law if the law, if those who are the law be heirs, faith is made void. Now, some people try to think that the Jewish people couldn't inherit the land because they didn't keep the law. And that gets a little confusing because clearly for not keeping the Sabbaths and for not keeping certain things related to the ceremonial law, they were eventually cast out of the land, right? But it was more than that. And this is something that you have to understand with the Mosaic Covenant. The law was given, and I cover this in the Hebrew study, the law was given not to individuals, but to the nation. And the nation was to keep that law in order to stay in the land. Okay, that is true. But being uh, disobedient as an individual to that law could not disqualify you from your ultimate inheritance uh, which is by faith. So all genuinely faithful, believing Israelites who believe in the promise of the seed and believe that their need of a salvation through blood will find themselves resurrected into the land eventually and will enjoy that inheritance, even if they lived in a time when they were uh, cast out 
due to national disobedience. So really the disobedience that you see in the Old Testament was the national disobedience. And I'm talking about when God had to drive them out of the land uh, and let the temple be destroyed and all that stuff. It was national disobedience, specifically by the leadership who appointed high places of worship and demanded that people worshiped idols and even killed the priests and killed the prophets. Okay, it's a national thing. The law was really given to the nation as well as the, the ceremonial and m m moral. And you can prove this because there were times when there was no temple, which means no ability to keep the feasts, right? And yet, Daniel, Meshach, Abednego, everybody who was faithful in, Jer in Babylon, they couldn't keep the feasts, and yet they were still justified in walking with God. And uh, Naomi and you know Naomi went out of the land because of the famine and came back. She remained a believer. She remained faithful to God. So as an individual, you're justified by faith. But as a nation, they could be disciplined due to failure to keep the Mosaic Covenant, which pa Paul makes a big point about in Galatians to say that that was given 400 years after the everlasting covenant made to Abraham and could not disannul or make or add conditions to that covenant to make it of no effect. So he was saying, the whole point is that by being Abraham's seed, by walking in faith, you are an heir according to the promise and you can't be disqualified for failing to keep the law. Your inheritance is secure in Christ. And that is a matter for the individual versus this one period of time when the law was given to the nation and they were disciplined uh, or blessed based on their national failure or uh, ability to keep that, right? Right. We know that they, and, and they were there as a teaching model to show the nations that, look, it's not going to work just you being godly. You need Christ in your midst. Not only that, you need to be remade. You need a covenant where I write my law in your inward parts, or even better, you need to be regenerated, made a member of Christ, a member of the body of Christ. Um, anyway, for where the law works wrath, for where there is no law, there's no transgression. Now, the law, law works wrath. You think, oh, that the law makes God angry at me. Actually, no, the law works wrath in man. When we get to it, we'll get to Romans 8, where it talks about the carnal mind, which is the mind of performance set on the flesh because of the, still being under the law, and it becomes enmity against God. And it's because he's wor you're working, when you're under the law, you're working for a, a wage. You think you've put God in your debt by your own righteousness. And so you're working, and, and the reward is counted as a debt, and God owes you something. And yet, if you don't keep the whole of the law, but you break in one point, you've broken the whole thing. So no blessing for you. And so you start to get mad because God isn't paying you what you think is your due. And you become more and more frustrated. And so the law works wrath in you. And eventually you become angry at God because you can't serve mammon and the Lord. You'll either love the one and hate the other, right? So that's what the law is a mammon system where you are trying to work for a wage where you're exchanging your effort for blessing or whatever. That whole principle is ruled out. We can't go that route or it will work wrath. It'll make you frustrated, angry. It doesn't make God angry. He's already revealed his wrath, right? Uh, and he's going to reveal it at the end. He's not mad at you if you're under the law and a, as a believer. He's sad for you and can't wait for you to give up so that he can show the gospel to you. Uh, so the law works wrath. For there, Where there is no law, there's no transgression. And we'll get to that more in Romans 7. But he says, you know, I was alive once, but the sin, the law came, sin revived, and I died. There's a reason for that. Uh, the law actually exacerbates your sin and makes it more profound because your flesh takes advantage of you uh, and deceives you. And, and we'll talk about that. Uh, I don't want to get into that too much here. Um, my goodness, there's more. I'm just going to, I'm going to have to leave it here because I can go to this wedding. Um, so this will be a three-part Romans 4.